great pleasure to introduce our second session here, which is entitled Building Inclusive Local Economies, Agents and Institutions. And we have five speakers. Uh, Sarah McKinley from Dem Democracy Collaborative, Peter O'Brien from Yorkshire Universities, uh, Francis Northrop from the Economics Foundation, Luke Reeds from IPPR, and uh, Anthony Kane from the RSA. So everyone has got 10 minutes to present, and then we'll have uh, a bit of time at the end for questions, just like the previous session. So could we begin, please, with Sarah? Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Um, thank you, Martin, for putting this together and for having me here. Um, I, uh, too, like Neil, feel pretty unprepared. And also, like Neil, I have uh, whiskey running through my veins, but uh, not in a fortifying sense, so apologies up front for that. Um, anyways, uh, I, I told Neil I was just going to say what he said and sit down again, but no, I promise I will talk a little bit. Um, and I, um, to, to stay on point and, and on time, I'm going to be reading from the notes I prepared, um, but I hope I don't bore you to death. So, first of all, a little bit about the Democracy Collaborative. I know a number of folks in the room know a little bit about us already, um, so I won't go on and on about it. But as you can tell from my accent, we are an American organization based in Washington, D.C., but we do a lot of work um, transatlantically to build partnerships. Um, we're a think tank, like class, a think and do tank. Um, and what that looks like is that we are working to create more democratic economies by developing new models and pathways from theory to action that engage institutions and catalyze networks to build community wealth and drive system change. <coughs> that's, that's what we do. Um, you know, we've already heard a lot this morning about uh, institutions. Um, we all in this room know what the problems are uh, that we're facing, um, so I won't go deeply into it, but um, you know, in the U.S., and I'm going to speak largely from a U.S. context, so I'm going to give a lot of examples and best practices of what's happening in cities and communities across the U.S., um, and particularly what institutions are doing in those, um, in those places. That is going to give you a really in-depth um, uh, uh, look at what's happening in Richmond, and I'll create um, some, some, uh, a broader picture of what else is going on in the U.S. Um, in some places. So. Um, as you know, uh, as wealth is con concentrating, wages are stagnating, um, and particularly uh, for um, working class people um, and people of color in the United States. Um, the result is that a lot more people are depending on public goods and services in place at the same time that those are being undercut um, and underfunded and particularly eroded by tax breaks to large corporations. In the US, that's about $80 billion a year in tax breaks um, to large corporations. Although that statistic now is about three years out of date. I imagine it's even more now. Um, so that's a, that's a huge amount of money being thrown away for corporations that really don't need that kind of tax break. I'm sure you've all heard about the latest uh, race to the bottom with Amazon trying to locate a new um, headquarters in a city um, across the country, and you really just had a just embarrassing display of cities trying to you know, undercut themselves and, and, and throw things away. So, so the result is that you see what we call the phenomena of throwaway cities. Um, you have uh, places with high dependency and no resources to address needs. Um, I know this is all too familiar here as well. So. Um, Anyways, uh, we, we talk about community wealth building and, and how you can start to address these issues at the local level. We've heard about that already this morning. We're going to hear a lot about it from Thad and others. Um, but these efforts are happening all over. Uh, they're happening all over the U.S. They're happening all over the world. As you know, they're, they're happening here. As you know, Preston and other places are doing incredible things locally uh, in spite of um, the system, in spite of uh, what's happening in the world. So... Um, this panel, we're going to talk about institutions. We've heard a lot about institutions, but, but what can institutions actually do? Um, what does that look like? Why are they important? So in the United States, we talk largely about anchor institutions, or what we call eds and meds, universities, hospitals, city governments, um, public nonprofit institutions um, that are uh, rooted in place. Um, that their, their success goes hands in hand, hand in hand with the success of a place. Um, uh, they have a, a mutual self-interest in the 
the viability of those places. So institutions, uh, most of these institutions have a mission to serve in some sense, um, and they are huge economic actors in place. They are the largest employers and purchases of goods and services in many, many communities, as you know. Um, they are what we like to call sticky capital. Unlike corporations, they're not going to pick up and leave whenever they can. Um, they can't, uh, as a matter of fact. So, so just a little bit of statistics about these uh, eds and meds in the U.S. Hospitals and universities alone employ over 9 million people in the U.S. That's 5% of the labor force in the United States. Um, they procure over $500 billion in goods and services annually. Um, so if you think about... If, if that was directed intentionally and, and um, committedly to a place and to specific people living in the place, what a huge impact that could have in those places. Um, so uh, I'm going to give some examples of what that looks like. We call that an anchor mission, to consciously apply the economic impact of your institution along with your... With your um, social capital and other and other things to the benefit of, of a specific community. So how can you do that? Um, you can do that in many ways. Um, Neil and others have already talked about different ways that institutions can can be more engaged in, in their communities. They can create pipelines to employment in partnership with local workforce development organizations. They can tailor their training needs um, uh, to, to the institutional needs so that you have a better match for good and sustainable jobs. You can redirect um, purchasing um, percentages, but I mean, if you like, all of your purchasing eventually should be in support of local communities, local suppliers um, who are employing people locally. Um, you can invest endowments. Many of these institutions have very large endowments that are currently invested to try and get um, high profit um, on Wall Street. So what if those were invested um, in community institutions? Um, uh, creating capital availability um, for that. You can, uh, institutions can create community land trusts to protect affordability and land affordability over time um, for local residents rather than having their real estate activities displace um, and push people out, which is often what happens when institutions take on real estate development. Um, so they can lend research and technical assistance to the betterment of the community. All of these things are really, in a sense, common sense, right? Um, these are what institutions should be doing anyways, um, but they haven't been doing this for a long time. Um, so, so what does it look like um, when, when these institutions embrace an anchor mission, put all in um, for mission, as we say, um, to, to serve their communities? So um, you've probably heard of the Cleveland model. Have folks heard about the Cleveland model in the room? Um, OK, so I'll speak very briefly about the Cleveland model. Um, and I, I know we're going to hear more about Preston later from Matthew and others, um, and the Cleveland model and Preston have sort of been learning from one another as we go. But uh, the Democracy Collaborative has been working in Cleveland now for, gosh, 10 years, I would say, um, uh, with a, a network of um, anchor institutions, large <coughs> hospitals, universities, museums, the city government, all came together to really understand or think about why you know, you have these world-class institutions that are doing well and, and thriving and succeeding, and they're completely surrounded by blight, disinvestment, urban decay, um, and all the statistics that come with that, high unemployment, um, low uh, health outcomes, and so on and so forth. So how could these institutions better um, use the way that they do business? And, you know, we've been talking about changing the character of the way institutions do business. And so this was a really intentional effort to think about the way they're already doing business and how can they change it? And what does that look like when you inherently change the way that you as an institution operate, um, particularly with regards to your economic impact? So um, taking examples from other places around the world, Mondragon um, uh, especially, which I'm sure most of you know about, um, what would that look like applied in a specific place um, with, with the needs and assets of that community in mind? So currently there are... Um, three cooperatives uh, created as part of this Cleveland model called the Evergreen Cooperatives. It's a network of employee-owned cooperatives that provide goods and services to these institutions in Cleveland, hiring people from the community, um, people who have high barriers to entry, um, high incarceration rates, things like that. It's difficult for them to find employment, but they can not only find employment in in these cooperatives, they can get vested in the cooperatives, they can build their assets and so forth. So, um, as I said, there are three. Uh, one is an industrial scale laundry, one is an industrial urban greenhouse, and another does um, 
LED retrofitting, um, solar panel installation, and things of that nature for the institutions. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been doing this now, or Cleveland has been working on this now for, for almost 10 years, with fits and starts, and it's had its successes and its failures, and it's been extremely challenging um, and a huge investment of time and energy. Um, but we're starting, after all this time, to see scale and potential coming out of, of this. So just this summer, in fact, the Cleveland Clinic, which is uh, one of the largest hospitals in Cleveland, um, turned over, it had, I think, 3% of its, its laundry going to, to um, the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. It turned over all of its laundry, um, as well as the laundry facility that um, Sodexo had owned to the Evergreen Cooperative. So now um, the Evergreen Cooperative's added at least 100 new employees. Um, they will be vested after a certain period, so they will also be employee owners as well. And then also, just at the end of this year, um, they announced the Fund for Employee Ownership. So the Evergreen Business Solutions now has a Fund for Employee Ownership um, that is strategically acquiring businesses as they are going out of business and converting them into employee ownership. So you start to see um, employee owned cooperatives. So you start to see this potential for, for scale and real um, radical change um, be beyond uh, where we've been. But, you know, Cleveland is, is just perhaps one of the better known examples, but this kind of work or this notion of using and leveraging institutional economic impact for the betterment of community is happening all over the United States. So, um, uh, and, and, and not just in purchasing. So, for example, in Cleveland, you see also workforce development. So there's something called Step Up to UH, which is a pipeline for, for employment directly linked to the needs of the institutions and then matched with um, local organizations that are working with, with people to develop skills and feed them in there. And the, and the result is that actually the hospital has had um, higher retention of, of employees. There's a pathway for those employees to move up the ladder so they're not just stuck in these dead-end jobs that they come in at. So it's, it's created a much more sustainable way of, of employing people, both for the institution and for the community. Um, but, you, but you see this all over. Um, in, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, one of the earliest adapters of, of the notion of an anchor mission. Um, uh, and, and interestingly enough, the, the impetus for them was, was actually a series of, of crimes on, on campus, and they realized that they really you know, they, they couldn't just build walls to keep this stuff out, and it was affecting, you know, who was coming to the institution and, and what that looked like. And so they, they understood that um, they had to start to be more engaged to make positive impact. So since then, they've implemented a bi-local program, funneling over $100 million um, into local enterprise. Um, they launched a skills initiative connecting hiring needs to local residents. They've contracted with local women and minority-owned firms on construction projects. They've opened a center that focuses exclusively on improving the quality of life of residents um, in their community. Um, and they have uh, invested over $500 million directly into their community um, in different ways. So uh, that's just one example. Gunderson Lutheran Health System um, in uh, Wisconsin. It's a very rural area, um, so a lot of people always think of this as, as only an urban um, uh, example or an urban solution that is, can work in, in um, rural areas as well um, and as I mentioned this health system that works across a rural part of um, Wisconsin uh, their, their motivation was ecological um, you know uh, they wanted to go net zero and they realized to do that they had to source things locally so um, they helped create um, a multi-stakeholder uh, food cooperative that could aggregate from local small <laughs> farms to actually meet the needs of the hospital system. And, and now the whole hospital system is, it, their food services are supplied directly by local small farms as a result of this. Um, and, and the multi-stakeholder cooperative really is a value-added cooperative as well. So they, um, they create uh, f freezer goods so that these products can last throughout the year. They, they do canning and things like that. Um, an example that's uh, deeply close to my heart um, is on the Pine Ridge Reservation with a group called Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. Um, and this, for me, sort of falls into the category of if it can be done here, this work can be done anywhere. So um, for those of you who don't know Indian country um, in, in the US, um, uh, there are really horrifying statistics. Everything um, that you know sounds bad about what's happening um, in communities in, in urban areas. Um, it's twice as, as bad, if not more, um, places like Pine Ridge, which is an 
Indian Reservation. Um, statistics like 80% unemployment. Um, it is the poorest part, uh, poorest part of the Western Hemisphere aside from Haiti. Lowest, second lowest life expectancy in the Western Hemisphere aside from Haiti. An adult male's life expectancy on Pine Ridge Reservation is 46 years of age. So um, if we're not horrified by that, then, then there's something wrong if that doesn't move you. So, so um, it, the, the conditions are, are awful, um, but the people are resilient and are deeply connected to community, to one another, and, and um, to the earth, and thinking deeply about what they can do to, as they say, decolonize um, the way economic development has been done to them and, and is being done across the world. Um, so uh, they came together um, uh, to do a whole community-wide planning process, um, talking to elders, talking to young people. In this process, many people were saying this is the first time anyone has ever asked them what they wanted in their community. Um, and the result was a plan for a regenerative community because they heard over and over and over again that they need housing and jobs. Housing and jobs, housing and jobs. So. Um, Thunder Valley Development Corporation was created to develop um, a housing, um, a mixed use, mixed income housing development um, for people. And as they were doing this, they realized they were going to generate a fair amount of economic activity just by building it. And what, what most people do when they're building a community, they hire a construction company from somewhere else, uh, usually a, a large scale corporate owned construction company. Thunder Valley said, we're not going to do that. If we're going to build this community, we're going to create our own construction company. We're going to train people in our community to develop these skills. We're going to make them owners of the company so that they can, um, so that they can uh, have a stake in, in, um, in the benefits of this, so they can profit from it, um, and, and then so can the community. They, they have done this uh, report on how much money circulates in the community, um, and it showed that within... 36 hours, 98 um, cents out of the dollar was leaving the reservation because there was nowhere on the reservation for that money to go. Um, so, so two cents stayed on the reservation. So there was no money circulating internally. So, so really thinking through how they could use what they were doing to help improve the community also have these impacts that would keep money circulating in the community, keep people in, in, in community invested in place. Um, and, and moving forward, and they're, they're now in phase two of their development. I will tell you that the construction company is, is quite small, and they've had to, and there are huge challenges. They've had to bring in outside experts, outside firms to really move them along, but, but, but they're, they're getting there, and they're understanding that as they do this, they're also creating other impacts, so they're going to have you know, a land management cooperative as well as, as they build this community. Uh, a water management cooperative. They're seeing these effects that, that can go out from there. So the point is, there are, you know, we're talking about hospitals and universities, but there are other ways of thinking about institutional economic actors and, and thinking broadly about what your economic activity is doing in place and, and how you can use that for the benefit of your community. So I'll <coughs> Sarah, so we've got Peter O'Brien next. Just take some more. <laughs> like Neil and other people, it's my first day back at work after two weeks off. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Martin, for the, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Peter O'Brien. I'm executive director of Yorkshire Universities, but I'm also uh, a researcher at Newcastle University. Uh, in urban and regional development, uh, where we've been looking at issues around governance, uh, issues around infrastructure funding and financing, uh, and I'm particularly interested in the whole issue of universities uh, as anchor institutions, which I'm going to talk to you about uh, this afternoon. Um, because I think, I think it's pretty critical for a region like Yorkshire uh, that our universities are like absolutely central to this, this particular agenda. It's not without its issues and its challenges, though, and I'd like to kind of uh, illustrate some of these. Now, so the hopefully there's going to be a, a dash of abstract and a sprinkling of, of practice, uh, as requested by the chair this morning. Uh, um, and I'm just going to set the scene in some context and just talk a little bit about what's happening, I guess, in Yorkshire, and a couple of examples there, uh, and what we're trying to do as Yorkshire uh, universities. So first of all, some sort of context, I guess. Universities are in the spotlight. I travelled down, I live in Newcastle, so I travelled down from Newcastle this morning, and there was another report in the press about uh, funding of universities. Uh, I think Tank produced a report about 
how we fund higher education. So it seems it's not a day goes by when universities are not coming in for some form of scrutiny or critique, and, and many of us would say that's a good thing. You know, we should be open and transparent working in the sector. But equally, um, they've faced a fairly hostile press and media, one would argue, over the last sort of year or so. There's also been significant institutional and regulatory change. For those of you who don't know, in the higher education sector, we now uh, treat our, our students as a, as a consumer. Uh, so we have a new regulator, uh, Office for Students, and we have a new uh, research uh, infrastructure under the auspices of UK Research and, and Innovation. And there's been profound changes in the way in which universities have been funded and financed. Now, one might argue that's going to change uh, if the Yorker Review is anything to go by, which is looking at higher education funding. Uh, comes up with proposals going forward. Uh, equally, uh, there's been um, uh, an issue around demographics of so student numbers, particularly undergraduate level. You'd be aware of that. The universities are competing hand over fist for uh, students as a, as, uh, a primary source of uh, income. <coughs> and let me be the first, apologies mine, to say uh, Brexit as well has clearly thrown issues around the role of uh, higher education universities going forward. So, amidst all of that kind of context, I think there's also been increasing interest and activity surrounding the role of universities as anchor institutions. And I'm interested in the work that's happening in the US and also in Australia, where we've been looking at, uh, at the role of regional universities, in particular there, in that country. I think it's also um, the issue of universities as anchor institutions has been amplified by what's happening in local government. And so the cuts that's taking place to local uh, government budgets, I think, has shone a spotlight on universities as significant actual anchor institutions and actors in their own right and in particular people have rightly asked what are universities doing for their town and their city so there's been a, an explosion if you like of, of interest and scrutiny in universities and what they're doing beyond the academy uh, in terms of civic society and the economy I think um, this probably points towards my question that I asked in the previous session there's been relatively weak forms of uh, devolved or decentralised governance in the UK particularly in England and I think that's put uh, renewed focus and pressure upon institutional arrangements for economic development. Uh, with weak forms <coughs> of governance, pressure and interest is uh, focused upon other institutions like universities about how they're actually managing the process of governing economic development at a subnational level. And I think policymakers uh, throughout the world, and one suspects if you look at the UK, uh, it's pretty, pretty adamant, uh, see universities as critical to delivering prosperity. However, you might want to frame that. Every leader uh, seemingly wants a university in their own town and city. Um, so there's a big sort of demand, if you like, a big push to see universities as being critical, if you like, to uh, the economy. Um, the previous uh, Vice Chancellor of Newcastle University uh, begged the question uh, it's not only an issue about what the university is good at, it's what the university is good for. Um, <coughs> that's right, and I would agree with that. Um, this was somewhat uh, perhaps uh, undermined by. The fact that uh, Newcastle University chaired the Newcastle Fairness Commission, uh, which argued for the living, all public employees to pay the living wage, and Newcastle University would not do it itself because it didn't want to outsource its uh, pay uh, and conditions policy to, to others. So I think universities, if they're really going to take this seriously, have got to look at what they're doing within their own institutions as employers in their, in, in their own right. Universities clearly can play a role in issues around technology innovation and skills. Um, but I would argue that we need probably a more inclusive and co-produced form of innovation when we're thinking about local and regional development. And there is a, um, a, probably a, a view that science is seen as an elite exercise. In a previous contribution, we talked about experts. And perhaps there is something about how we look at, and I'm interested in place, I'm an economic geographer, how we look at things like innovation in places, and how we look at um, experts within the academy working in communities. And that answers Neil's sort of question and challenge thrown down to it at the Academy about how we work as uh, researchers and how we work with uh, people out there in the wider world. I would argue as well that not all university, not one sorry, university can operate in all the different domains in this agenda in anchor institutions, that um, there are diverse <coughs> universities and they can all play a different role. And I would say that wouldn't I as Yorkshire universities are comprised of research intensive post-92s and small specialist institutions. So each of them brings something different, I think, to this particular agenda. Um, some of you will remember the Witty Review. Uh, Witty argued that research and teaching in universities is enabled and catalyzed by university engagement in local and regional economies. 
And my colleagues in Kurds at Newcastle University have done a lot of research on the whole question of the civic university, and they have argued that teaching, research, and engagement should be integrated with local and regional economic development, and that universities should absorb local and regional agendas into their core institutional strategies. I would probably throw that out to, to questions later. But in order to do this, universities have to engage effectively with wider communities. They have to understand the place in which they're located. That's the city, the town, the city region, or the wider region. They have to have a strong sense of purpose, and they have to invest in this kind of civic engagement activity as well. It won't just happen through osmosis. They also need to be transparent, to be open, to be accountable. <coughs> Most universities are charities. You know, their core mission is to do good. I think this has to be a central piece of what they do as institutions. Geography matters. So places shape the identity of particular universities. Uh, places can act as a, uh, a living laboratory. <coughs> the university can shape some economic and social life of places, working with communities. And really for successful civic activity um, and to persuade universities to become more effective civic actors, we need to understand, though, how universities operate, how they're led, how they're managed, how the staff within universities feel about this particular agenda, how they're incentivised. So myself, as, uh, say, as an academic at Newcastle University, what's the incentive for me to get involved in this particular agenda? I think that's really important. Beyond my social value system, which tells me this is a really significant and important and we should be doing this, how might the system and how might the institution incentivise researchers to take an active role in this agenda? You may be aware of the Civic University Commission, uh, which is led by Bob Kerslake, who's Chair of Governors at Sheffield O'Hallam University, one of our members. It's asking two questions. First, how can universities be both global and how can they be local? And second, what would a civic university look like in the 21st century? In answer to the first, I think a university can be globally excellent and also be locally relevant. I've heard people say that it's impossible for a university to strive for global excellence whilst at the same time making a difference to local and regional communities. I disagree profoundly with that. I think you can do both. In a period of 12 years, the UK higher education sector has seen its income and its expenditure overall grow by 350%. This is an enormous sector. If you think about it in terms of its economic contribution, and so narrowing it down to its economic contribution, it's the second largest sector in terms of UK's exports. It's enormous. But with that has come major challenges and pressures. You know, income has risen by 350%, expenditure has risen by 350%. There's some issues there that I think we need to address. What about the incentives then that I talked about in terms of enabling this to happen? Now, if you're an academic, and I know in Newcastle, you know, we're now thinking about the REF, and in fact case studies, and everyone's putting a picture to that. There's a whole industry emerging around this. But perhaps through performance management frameworks like the knowledge exchange framework, there could be something there which would encourage and enable universities to take a more active role this particular agenda. In Australia, the Regional Universities Network has published a performance framework for regional universities. These are the universities who work more closely with indigenous communities in Australia than any other university, saying to government, look, we can do this work if you incentivise and fund us to do this better. And I know through the Democracy Collaborative work, speaking with your colleagues, that your anchor institution, HG Scorecard, is making some real inroads there. <coughs> So at Yorkshire Universities, we're now in our 32nd uh, year. But many of you might not have heard of us. I've been in post for a uh, little under a year. Uh, we have 12 members. The smallest is Leeds College of Music, uh, has an income of 12 million. The largest is the University of Leeds, 675 million. So it's a diverse membership there. A total income of £2.8 billion pounds per annum of our 12 members. It's chaired by Sir Chris Husbands, the VC of Sheffield Hallam University, and each of the universities in total, sorry, in total, the universities produce 64,000 graduates a year, have 34,000 employees and 32,000 indirect jobs are dependent on the universities. So there's a major asset here within Yorkshire, I think, that we can utilise better. Over 12 months ago, our board of VCs agreed a new strategy for Yorkshire universities to focus on place, to focus on the economic, social and the civic contribution of the universities and higher education institutions in Yorkshire, to use that diverse membership to the best of our uh, uh, interest, 
And our members fundamentally believe that successful universities have a critical role to play in regions and to play in civic society. But this won't happen just through talking about this and through producing papers, as has rightly been said earlier on. Central to our work is to play an active role in industrial strategy and policy, to play an active role in civic society, and to enable our members to kind of work as anchor institutions in their various towns and cities. What we're looking to do as a membership organisation is to develop a community of practice, to draw upon UK and international best practice and experience, and to support our members to really become the anchor institutions which we know they can, and to help them overcome some of the barriers to this particular work. And secondly, to also lobby national government and the funders and the regulators so that they recognise the value of this work alongside other work that universities undertake. So there are two particular examples that I want to talk about to give some practice to this uh, contribution. The first is uh, not a million miles away from here, York St. John University. Um, one of the biggest employers in the city of York has published a 2026 strategy which is centred around the role of the university as an anchor institution, uh, emphasising the importance of the university being trusted within the city, and is seeking to, and has achieved by all accounts, academic buy-in into the strategy. And I think this is really important, how the academic community within universities buy into this and recognise this as being critical to the mission, the core mission of universities. And the strategy is focused on social justice and strengthening the contribution of York St. John to improving York as a place. So there's a number of different elements, some of which we've heard about today. Engaging public engagement with the wider community through cultural activity, uh, being a fair uh, employer through uh, fair pay, working better with the local supply chain, developing a stronger partnership, working with York City Council, recognising the City Council's face particular challenges in terms of its budgets and its service delivery, establishing a new mental health partnership with the NHS, widening participation, funding a number of community projects and looking to sort of develop a new approach to inspiring learning within the university. The second example would be the Leeds Anchor Institution Framework, which brings together three universities, University of Leeds, Leeds Beckett, Leeds Trinity University. This is funded by Leeds City Council and involves the health sector and other institutions within the city of Leeds. There is a potential here for action in five particular domains. The first, as employers, the second, around again procurement, we heard today, the use of physical assets, the civic contribution and collaboration of each of the institutions, including universities, to the <coughs> well being of the city of Leeds, and how might services be delivered in a more progressive manner in that city as well. Each dimension is broken down into specific elements and the institutions identify where they can make a particular difference. They then produce a scoring mechanism, they then undertake self-assessment and identify the areas where they each want to make a particular improvement to the work that they're doing. And this framework is backed up by good practice studies, evidence, research, signposts for future resources, and an annual review evaluates progress. So this is at the early stages of implementation and development, but you can see within the city of Leeds, three <coughs> universities wanting to work together with local government, with the health sector, to use their particular strengths and assets in a certain way in order to kind of make a difference for that city. The proof will be in the pudding, of course, when we evaluate progress. Well, finally, I just want to leave you with some key messages and conclusions. First is that universities are significant anchor institutions and civic actors. And this is happening here and now. The HG sector and others cannot really ignore it. Uh, it's expected of universities to be challenged to undertake this. Perhaps it's better to shape and embrace it than uh, it's being uh, uh, kind of delivered and foisted upon them. Secondly, it's probably best not to complicate matters. Universities can use existing mechanisms, tools, resources and assets to make this happen. Whilst it's probably very helpful that the system and the regulatory system does its bit to enable this to uh, come to fruition. There's also things that universities can do here and now. I'm probably not spend a great deal of resource doing as well. It's about strategy and leadership from the top. It's important to share ideas and good practice, provide space for joint learning, and that's what we're trying to do at Yorkshire Universities. It's about communicating internally and externally. I had a conversation with somebody just before the break which talked about the importance of communicating with local people, but I think that's extremely important within universities and across universities, how you communicate about what actually the university can do around the institution concept. 
Fifth is about place and geography matters. That was really important. Think about the scale. Think about the specific <coughs> institutions, the economies and communities that universities are engaged with and are located in particular regions. And sixth and finally, clearly there are headwinds, there are pressures, there are forces coming down the train, uh, down the path, sorry, to universities in 2019 that may seek to divert universities from this agenda. And there may be a challenge about universities retrenching. And I think, given what we've heard this morning, given what the expectation is of universities, that would be a profound mistake. I think universities can do both, but it's about investment, it's about strategy, it's about leadership, and it's, above all else, it's about actually seeing this as being part of the core mission of <coughs> universities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we have Francis next. Thank you. Uh, so hello everybody, it's a real pleasure to be here, it really is, with friends and colleagues it feels like a great start to the year. Um, I would just reflect on what Neil said about how he's tried not to radicalise people at parties over the last couple of weeks, and I also have tried not to do that, but inevitably somebody always says to you, don't they, what do you do? And I go, oh. <laughs> what do I do? So uh, I say I, I work for a think tank. And you see their eyes start to kind of slide around behind you, kind of looking for a way out of the conversation. I'm like the anti Jerry Maguire, you know, like you want to see a tank. But actually what happens then is that sometimes somebody says, yeah, I know what a think tank does. And even better, they say, oh yeah, the New Economics Foundation, I've been following their work for years, I think they're brilliant. And then the poor bugger gets to like half an hour of you saying how incredible a place it is to work. So I've been at NEF for the past year. Um, and before that, my background was in working in place, um, in communities. And so I'm amazed by the capacity of the people who work at NEF and other think tanks and the people that I work with. It's just, it's like the best kept secret, really. There are people with academic experience, there are people with research, with you know, policy experience, with, in our place, community organising, community development. And also a really strong kind of um, background in comms and amplifying the voice of people. And so the reason that I started um, my role at NEF was because of the emphasis on local economies and the need to, of course it's really important to try and influence policy at a national level, but also it's really, really important to bring those tools in service to people in place who are doing things. And so um, we, uh, to use an example, we're delivering a programme on behalf of How to Change, who are a funder around community business, and we're doing that <coughs> in partnership with CLESS and with Co-op UK, and we're working with seven communities across, the, uh, across England who are looking at ostensibly establishing community business in those places. But actually, once you get there, what you're doing is you're working with really well-established community organisations who, in the interregnum that you talked about, Neil, have been just getting on with stuff because they have to, because their immediate population are absolutely in dire straits. You know, there's not enough to eat, they can't feed their houses. And so, inevitably, these centres have become homes for people where they go and they talk and they visit and are able to uh, you know, kind of get services. And what we found in those places, so we're working in Grimsby, we're working in Leicester, um, in Wigan, in Hartlepool, in Plymouth and in Bradford. And what we're finding is that the people who are in those community organisations are like, where have you been? Because like, we've been waiting for somebody to come along and talk about what we're doing. What we're doing is fundamentally economic. What we're doing, it's not nice community development over here. And I think we have this sort of separation in our minds and we have these artificial divides where we talk about community development and economic development, you know, social policy, economic <coughs> policy. We talk about academia and we talk about think tanks and we talk about community organisations. And we don't see how actually those things are inevitably linked. And we, we start to, we, you know, we kind of all have our own niches and we stay within those niches and we very rarely come together. So events like this are really, really welcome. But I'd really like to see a crossover of, say, like a locality event, which is a massive convention of people who are supported in community organisations across the UK to provide those services that I talked about. 
but they're very firmly over here in the kind of, are you lovely communities doing nice things for yourself while we're getting on with the economy over here? Thanks very much. And so we need to bring people together so it's not a national local and it's not an economic social. It's like you know, kind of a, a whole family of people being brought together. And I think there's a real role for us in think tanks to do that, to bring those those skills that we have in service to those people and to those communities, to charities that are working there. Because inevitably, those people have done this thinking too. They're not like, you know, they're not sort of, um, you know, benign recipients <coughs> of what kind of flows at them. They're active, they are radical, they're activists, and they want to be part of something which is about fundamentally changing the system and stuff that we're talking about every day. Um, and I think there's also a real role, and I know Neil touched on this as well, about funders, and with some honourable exceptions, look at you, Joe, Friends Provident Foundation, and a few other funders, <coughs> Those places are often expected to talk about the pain. They have to keep describing how shit it is to live in that place. And there's something really fundamentally wrong about that. And it gets inside people that they have to be, you know, they have to kind of keep reliving this nonsense that they're having to live through whilst they're trying to kind of shore up the worst excesses of what's happening. And so there's a real role for funders to understand that too and to bring kind of money in service and recognise that that can be matched with money from local government, from the anchor institutions, the things that we're also talking about, how that money is aggregated. So important. And so really, I suppose, thinking about the title of this particular session as agents, we are agents of change, but agents are acting on behalf of somebody else. We're not doing it for ourselves. And that's what that's partly what I really love about working at NEF. The people I work with fundamentally believe in change for people. They care about people. They're hugely compassionate. And I know that's true of everybody else in other organisations. And so what we need to start doing now, and I, I didn't know what Neil was going to say, but it doesn't surprise me that it's a very, very similar message, what we need to start doing is bringing all that power that we have. We have power. And we need to bring that to the people where they live. Because we know what to do. We know what the building blocks are. We know that it's public banking. We know it's an anchor institution procurement. You know, We know it's about public land. All the stuff is there. The building blocks are there. And so we need to be the people who are bringing that leadership, the new leadership that we need, the kind of leadership that Matt shows in Preston, I think, Social, socially um, intelligent, critically intelligent leadership, compassionate, collaborative, practical, just getting our hands dirty, getting out there, spending time with folk, basically. And I suppose uh, what I just wanted to end on was uh, a conversation with Matt uh, yesterday evening, and we were saying how nice it was for us all to be together, so we were people from Democracy Club to uh, IPPR. Um, and and we were sort of saying how good it was. And he said it's like a stadium concert. It's like a, a super group reunion kind of idea. And so I suppose what I think is that we've been rehearsing this for a really long time and we need to just get out there and do a really tight set. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so... My name is Luke Riggs. I work for the think tank IPPR North, in fact, not just the, the IPPR that's on the billing. Um, we're part of that think tank IPPR based in London, but we have our own offices in Manchester and in Newcastle. I think that's crucial, in fact, for the work that we do. We have an office yet in Yorkshire, but um, we can always rely on northern trains to get us here, of course. <laughs> I don't know how many northerns are in the room. Um, we conduct research on regional economies of the UK, focusing especially on the north, but not exclusively. And we propose the solutions, we hope, to some of the many, many problems that we've got. I'm fine. Excuse me. Um, so today I'm going to argue that to build these inclusive economies that we all want, we need actually new agents and, and new institutions to govern our towns, to govern our cities, to govern whole regions. I'm going to start by discussing the reality of this north-south divide that we often talk about, and then I'm going to sketch out how we can build uh, more inclusive local economies across the country, broad terms, broad brush. I'll get into too much detail. So... First to this north-south divide, I even hate using the words, in fact. If I don't, most people won't ha actually have a reference point. 
But rather than starting by talking about the productivity differentials between London and the North, as I sometimes do, it's probably best by starting off by asking who holds power in this country. Um, all similar countries really have much stronger regional and local democracy. Well, we don't have those institutions here. Instead, central government holds almost all the economic power that we have. So only about 6% of tax is raised locally in this country, 6%. And you could even argue that we don't have much control over that. That's compared to 20% in France and 52% in Germany. In the UK, we spend half as much as a proportion of GDP on local economic affairs compared to France and Germany. And in the UK, the central government has used this unrivaled power to favour a cluster of industries and individuals who are concentrated in one region, really. So that's especially finance, professional services, and of course real estate uh, in London and around its hinterland in the South East. So we can see this in the policies that have favoured those industries over many, many years. I won't go into monetary policy or regulation, so I'm not familiar with those. But it's also there in the regional statistics. So you might have seen that transport spending is twice as high per person in London as it is in the north. And almost two-thirds of R&D spending is in the three Golden Triangle regions of the South East, East and London. So it shouldn't really be a surprise that, as I say, London is more productive than the rest of the UK. London and the South East is about a third more productive than the national average. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Because those of you who come from London today don't need me to tell you that actually when you look at London, it's not a particularly uh, inclusive place, to say the least. And we don't see it as a model city region. Some people want to build the North as a, a greater London of the North, to make the North into a big super city, to copy London's template into the North. That is essentially what George Osborne wanted to do. But let's look a bit closer at London. Because we see a really dysfunctional economy in London as well, most of London's transport spending that I mentioned, it doesn't really go on the buses that get people to work, although those are better. Um, there's no new money for social housing, there's no money for employment support, there's no industrial strategy for the sectors in which most people work. That massive amount of spending that London gets on transport, it largely goes to, to big transport projects like Crossrail and Crossrail 2, and they're all designed really to shuttle professionals from the southeast into the centre more quickly, more efficiently, and more cheaply in many ways for them. And that R&D spending I spoke about, it goes on quite important things, of course, in, in pharmaceuticals and so on, but small employment sectors, and we expect that people are just going to benefit from these things, and we all know that they don't. And certainly not locally, within the local area. So central government just feeds this unsustainable boom in the South East, and by spending money in this way, actually, I'd argue government makes life more unpleasant for Londoners, more unequal, and more congested, in fact, the transport systems are more congested. So London's got this polarised labour market and a dysfunctional housing market, and if you live in London, you are more likely to be poor, in fact, than any other region. London's the most unequal region. <coughs> uh, house prices are 13 times the average in the first time buyers. Well being in London is the lowest. Anxiety levels are the highest. It affects how people feel about their everyday lives. So it's not the case that central government is just investing disproportionately in London. It's investing badly in things that don't actually benefit most Londoners. So this money could be used better either in London or in the rest of the country. This money could be used to modernise industries, train up low-skilled employees, regenerate town centres, connect great northern cities. So that, for me, is the reality of the North-South divide. It's not a simple economic divide. It's a you know, divide in central government favour, essentially. Support for these extractive, exclusive industries and wealthy individuals in the South East and for the things that they need, things that they rely on in the region where most of them, of course, live. So it's divided within a place as well as between places and they've linked these two divides. So it's not just an accident, it's central government that's actually made this situation come about. And all of our regions really have quite dysfunctional economies, and all of our regions therefore need to change. And if you want a radically different economy, then you have to do something radically different. And so we've done some thinking about what that alternative might look like, and in simple terms, I think we need to do two things. I'm going to... I'm not going to use the F word, federalism, it's, just kind of, it's a very loaded term. I'm not going to propose that, it's a particular form of devolution, but I do think that is the, the right direction of travel, much more autonomous, much more independent local and regional government, certainly it's the right direction of travel. Um, but second, the other thing we talk about is redistribution of sing, some, uh, significant amounts of money, targeted investment outside of London. So let's take each of these in turn. First, the devolution of power, significant devolution of power, much uh, further away than most suggestions at the moment. Now, the evidence is actually that devolution tends to generate more progressive outcomes, more local, more, more inclusive local economies, usually not all of them. Some of you might find that surprising. Sometimes people expect devolution to mean differentiation, to mean inequality and a race to the bottom. In fact, 
We see the opposite across the developed world. A race to the top, in fact, tends to result in the right circumstances. So you tend to see more investment in education, uh, greater equality, improved well-being, uh, better education outcomes, improved social welfare, GDP per capita tends to be higher, and regions actually tend to converge in more devolved countries. And the obstacles people often put in the path of devolution, often by those on the left, I think, actually, are either unfounded or quite easily resolved. Questions of unequal funding redistribution, that can be resolved. Questions of identity, it's for me a different question that people are asking there. The question about postcode lotteries, well, we already have those, so why don't we do something about them? So these are reasons to do devolution properly, but they aren't good reasons to keep power in, in Whitehall. But crucially, the benefit of devolution is highly dependent on the quality of the devolved government institutions that we have. So um, I won't talk about metro mayors, but that's you know a particular discussion that we can have if you like. We have recommended ourselves two tiers of formal governance um, that take on appropriate powers within England, four regions, and within these areas, city regions and, and county regions that take on most of the powers. But these need to be much more democratically accountable for this to work. So different non-mayoral models of election for city and county regions, an indirectly accountable regional tier that's much more accountable than the current situation at least, uh, robust and inclusive scrutiny processes at at all levels, more tripartite economic governance involving unions in economic policy much more, and participatory budgeting in citizen and citizens' assemblies and so on. All of these things are enabled by devolution, much, much more so. So there's some ideas about how governance needs to change, and that that will change things on its own. So second, we need to talk about the funding. We don't really talk about that much either. We expect people to just you know, find money down the back of the sofa, but actually um, we need to talk about serious amounts of money. So George Osborne talks about the Northern Powerhouse. We do talk about it ourselves. We're quite supportive of the idea that the North could be better. But when he speaks about it, he's cutting 6.3 billion out of the North while increasing spending in the South. So you have to kind of put your money where your mouth is. But it is possible, actually. You can, you can change things over time. Uh, one place that shows this very well is Germany, where many of you will be aware, east-west divided as opposed to a north-south one. At the fall of the Berlin Wall, East Germany accounted for the worst health inequalities in Europe. Now they've improved massively. It's actually England that has some of the worst health inequalities in Europe. East Germany used to lie behind productivity too, but it's now more productive than the north. So what's the secret? What changed? Well, firstly, they, a lot of things changed. Makes ways about it, but one of the major things is that they have those federal structures that I spoke about. But they also, since reunification, redistributed a massive amount of money towards the east. So they led the solidarity surcharge, a small addition to progressive taxes like income tax, capital gains, and corporation tax, nudging them up by uh, percentage points. A surcharge, not. Nice. If we did something similar in this country, and I don't quote me on this figure because it needs to account for behavioural changes, and I can catch character's eye at the moment. She said something, and I put it to her. Um, Roughly about 16, 17 billion pounds per year is what that would raise if we did something similar. So it's not a small amount of money. In fact, it enables far, far bigger spending than you might suppose, about 200 billion if you're talking about transport infrastructure. So if we are serious about addressing our regional problems, then we need serious and big solutions. So in, in summary, how do we build these inclusive local economies? <coughs> well, we don't have a north-south divide. We first need to understand the problem as it actually exists. All of our regions are deeply dysfunctional. And this has been caused by central government. It's not an accident. They didn't accidentally spend 15 billion on Crossrail, 31 billion on Crossrail too. This is deliberate. And in order to change this, we need to, to, to build these inclusive local economies. We need new agents and new institutions to do so. And we need to take power away from, from Whitehall, unelected quangos very often in Whitehall, and democratise them within the North. Finally, I'll tell you. from Martin uh, just before Christmas and my first reaction was, God, that's a great opportunity to get out of London on the first Monday. <laughs> but the second and more important reaction was actually, this is where probably the most, one of the most fertile and important um, intellectual and practical conversations about how we can confront some of the major challenges we're collectively facing in the UK, Europe, US and, and, and beyond. So I was desperate to be part of that. Um, from the RSA's point of view, and we're an establishment organisation in many respects, you know, we're called Royal, and um, the Princess Royal, in fact, are our, our president. Um, but we've ended up in an interesting space. We always sort of historically sought to combine ideas with action, 
um, embedded within social justice and increasingly it's taken us into the territory of the conversation around community wealth building and economic democracy so on and so forth so I was desperate for us as an institution to be part of that conversation because I think some of our practice and I'll come on to this um, in terms of our experimentation is, is aligned with a lot of the thinking and action that's taken place by lots of the organisations um, and stakeholders that are represented in this, in, in this room and you know, I'll get on to, this, to, to, to our sort of practical interventions, if you like, but not, not to say they're the right ones or the only ones or exemplary, but they're a drop in the ocean. There's so much going on, but just to say that you know, we want to be part of this conversation, we want to be part of making a collaborative contribution to how um, this conversation can move forward. Now, um, uh, very briefly, I'll just give, give a take on where, where we're at as a society, as a, as a set of societies almost. Um, and... I, I don't really buy into the, the sort of new wave optimism. I think we're in a very difficult set of situations, actually. I think a new wave optimism can seem quite insensitive in many respects and to those at the sharp end of some of the um, difficulties that we're facing. We're in the early stages of uh, technological um, replacement. Um, Carlos Perez talks about the sort of ways of, of general purpose technologies as, as she talks about it. And you have a sort of installation phase, a deployment phase, and these last between sort of 70 and maybe even 100 years. I think we're in the foothills um, of that replacement, which means there'll be enormous disruption to our economy, <coughs> society, democracy to come. We're already experiencing it. Um, and most particularly, this has been manifested, I think, in the early stages of a sharpening, widening of, it, of inequality um, in many different respects, in income, wealth, and also spatial. I think Luke's right about the spatial inequality not just being about north-south divide, it's within places um, as well. And, and that's in the early stages. We're kind of divided between a sort of prosperiat, if you like, and a precariat. And actually the two are related. If you're not within the prosperiat, then you're condemned in many respects. And we did a poll last year, by the way, that showed that 32% of people have access to um, readily accessible savings of less than £500, pounds, which is nothing. 41% have access to readily available savings of less than £1,000, which is next to nothing. Right? So you're in a very precarious situation, and you have a welfare state and a social contract, which is increasingly trying to get you to um, stick in that sort of um, precarious realm. Our energy system um, and our system of consumption is um, poisoning us in many respects. CO2 emissions are increasing. Um, there is a various forms of radical backlash politics, some of them are already toxic, Toxic, and they will continue to be, and increasingly so, many of these forms will emerge that end up being extremely tox toxic. Um, global financial um, imbalances, um, a shift in global power, um, are creating uh, new risks um, as geopolitical and power tensions, uh, and the global financial system creates uh, an alter risk for us as a society. So that's a set of conditions, a lot of which are external, but every country, I think, every society experiences these in different ways. The UK has had its own pathway um, towards its current situation. Um, and probably you could start off looking at this in the sort of 1980s with quite um, a coercive approach to widening the free market. Coercive in the sense that it took on collective institutions, and we talked about local government a lot today, the trade unions, and of course universities to, to, to a certain extent, um, and the state itself, um, to widen the scope of the free market is quite a status thing, Thatcherism, which is often, often sort of seen as sort of libertarianism, neoclassical, and that's part of it, but the, the authoritarian coercive state was part of it as well. Under New Labour, um, uh, we saw something that was probably a bit more paternalistic, um, and with a sort of what works mentality. Um, but there certainly was um, a better approach to distributional um, justice which mitigated market inequalities without um, reversing um, them. Um, but the problem with the what works mentality, and we're seeing this sort of perpetuate even in the sort of coalition and now the current government around sort of you know, nudge, paternalistic liberalism, uh, data, social innovation. All these things, by the way, are great tools, um, but they're as solutions, they're quite technical and they're not structural. And those big problems that I talked about earlier on are structural and challenges. So these two sort of fields of statehood, if you like, one which you can call a sort of coercive state and two you can call a sort of paternalistic state, I don't think quite have risen to the, the challenge. Um, so there's not a question as to what comes next. Um, I think there's two possible approaches to spring to mind. One is libertarianism. I don't think libertarianism 
ultimately will lead into those challenging problems um, in a way that will be transformative. And a second type of statehood is something like akin to a sort of civic republican or a civic statehood, yeah, where it's about um, infusing, um, using the state um, in order to empower relations within institutions, to create power with, to empower voice, community, and to give people some more control over their own lives with others. Um, and that takes place in terms of pushing back on the, um, not just the, the market and people having a way to put back on, on, on market relations is critical, but also the state as well. So we create more space for people to build good lives for them, their families, their, their community. And I think this is what we see actually, you know, have seen in Cleveland and, and Preston at a localised level, albeit from different directions. I think this has to be a very pluralistic agenda. My interpretation, and the whole speaker in the room have obviously a million times more informed about this than me, my interpretation of Cleveland is quite sort of civically driven uh, and led as an impetus. And Preston is quite municipally dread, uh, led and, 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 and driven. Um, now, eventually the two end up coming together. You end up with a sort of civic municipalism or municipal civicism, if you like. But the initial impetus comes from different directions. So it's important to look for multiple sources um, of action. At the RSA, um, we are trying to um, develop means of working with others in partnership to help um, communities and places develop collective voice and collective action. <coughs> And we do this a number of ways. I think that the, the topic of the session is one of the inclusive economy. And I think, uh, and by the way, there's lots of different phrases. We have an inclusive growth commission, an inclusive economy, community wealth building is part of the economic democracy. And, and, and we, absolutely, these, these, these phrases all have particular meaning and can also be quite meaningless because they're deployed in a whole series of different places in, in, in different ways. But I think there's four elements that, that for me are quite important. And I would say, I put this into four categories, inclusive wealth, inclusive livelihoods, inclusive voice, and including future generations. Right? And then I'm just going to say a few things that we're doing that I hope sort of show how we think, both in a sort of ideas and structural sense, but are also practical on the ground. <coughs> so from the perspective of inclusive wealth, uh, we put out a proposition about a year or so ago for a basic opportunity fund effectively the Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, funded via um, a, an endowment um, that would be replenished with levies on um, um, wealth, um, corporate and individual wealth, um, and supplemented with um, transfers on data levies to global digital platforms, going back to the sort of commons language that um, was discussed in the first um, session. With this, um, effectively, so Sovereign Wealth Fund, university in housing, um, energy, infrastructure, um, as well as some um, sort of global um, equity in order to generate a return which you would give to um, individuals taking as a basic income for two years out of ten for them and their families, right? to invest in shifting work, um, undertaking uh, caring responsibilities, education, setting up a business, whatever it may be. So there's quite sort of structural level um, intellectuals. By the way, that was one of the BBC um, business um, websites' top news stories of last year. So the notion that this stuff doesn't have um, sort of popular accessibility or appeal, I don't think stacks up actually. In fact, we were the top um, story on all the BBC websites for three days, um, and which we've got about me. Um, but I think it shows that there is an appetite for a different conversation about how wealth is invested and, and, and distributed. At a more local action level, um, out of our fellowship came an idea to um, establish some community savings banks, particularly in London and the South West, and we've been supporting that initiative. Community savings banks obviously recycle local um, assets and flows of wealth and support local businesses and people, particularly who are financially excluded. Um, so we try and support practical projects as, alongside um, big ideas. On the inclusive livelihoods, um, uh, in the inclusive livelihoods direction, we establish a future work centre, um, which obviously will come up with, with, with macro policy um, ideas. But also we'll set up sector labs, particularly in retail and probably care as well, where bringing we're bringing employers together uh, with trade unions and communities to think through actually collectively how you can create a better notion and a collective sense of what good work um, is. So quite quite sort of direct and discursive and, and, and trying to find if there is a willingness to, to, to pursue uh, new ideas and new spaces. We're also setting up um, something called Cities of Learning in Brighton and Plymouth and probably London and maybe Doncaster and Humber too, which brings whole communities around generating a sense of passion for learning includes anchor institutions and formal education institutions, business and community organisations to try and increase access to learning 
and ensure that when those who are passionate to engage in learning, that there are then pathways for them to improve their life um, opportunities. And we're also working with five on some universal basic income pilots and how you can civically embed basic income as a community changing intervention, not just an individualistic um, cash, um, cash payment. Inclusive Voice, we've had something called the um, Citizens Economic Council, um, which brought together a group of 60 citizens in Birmingham and Manchester and surrounding areas. Um, and what was interesting about that is the citizens obviously came not with ideology or partisanship, they came with values. And um, they put together their own sort of citizens charter. Um, with, and by the way, this technique has now been taken up by, by, by the Bank of England to improve their sort of um, their engagement with communities so they understand the impact um, of um, interest rate changes. Um, but they, they brought their values and came up with what I thought was quite a progressive um, charter, um, which I think is almost, it almost was a sort of community wealth building charter, um, actually. So when people are engaged in democratic voice, I think they feel, um, and with, with the opportunity to have influence, and it's real and it's authentic, um, I think this type of agenda finds, finds its home very quickly. And including future generations, we're working in a number of communities, rural communities, to think about what agriculture might look like if it were to be different type of commons. Now, I'm just going to find, just going to conclude, and i just throw all this out there, it's all, it's all there, but I just want to say, look, there's lots going on, I think we need to air and amplify what this is, what it can mean, and the impacts it can have. Think about ways to reach um, across political conversations, because it's not going to be enough for it to happen in particular environments, it has to be sustained, and the conversation about Barcelona is an interesting one, how do you sustain it beyond on commune? And if that's if, and the one way in which that cost, of course, is how do you have a sort of common understanding of what different political perspectives are seeking seeking to, to achieve? Um, but one common denominator in all of these things is is place. Um, there are big structural changes that are needed. The state does have to um, take on vested interests and power and seek to create new opportunities for people to be able to use resources to better their lives, communities, and so on. Um, but place is a common denominator, and it's in place and the civic where local citizen institutions, relations, democracy um, can flourish. I think obviously this was a blind spot when it came um, to Thatcherism first and paternalist liberalism, um, if you like. Um, I don't think it's a blind spot that is sustainable given where we are. And the only way out of this is a more sort of civic statehood. And I think that can be an open and engaging conversation that could meet some of the demands of these times. So, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, we're going to cut into the lunch break a bit here until about 20 past. So, can I get gather up four questions to begin with, please? So, um, any questions from the audience? So, please. Okay. So, uh, well, this is a question particularly to do with the anchor institutions, but linked to the, the particular relation to what Sarah said, but linked to um, some of the things that um, Jonathan said this morning about resistance and also um, Francis talked about in terms of community struggle. And that's, I mean, this is drawing from my own experience in, in Hackney, uh, and that's really quite slightly trying to problematise the idea that anchor institutions are necessarily sticky, are necessarily, you know, um, Rooted. I mean, they, they aren't, they'd like to be, but one's got to take account under our neoliberal sort of regime of the effect of privatization of cuts. I mean, for example, you know, things are moving in Hackney, as people have mentioned, but our key, one of our key anchor institutions is the Homerton Hospital, you know, a pretty important, you know, when you get off at Homerton Station, it says, you know, um, the place of the Homerton University Hospital, you know, and you swell with pride. You know, um, and it's it's a wonderful hospital to use, but you know it's now subject to all kinds of government plans to cut, to move, to downgrade, 
and it's an institution completely in under threat. So there, you know, the question then becomes: we can't just link up with it. We've also got to defend it. So, you know, in a way, the Labour Party is as much involved in the community wealth building initiative as the council, and hopefully the unions and the community organisations will be too. But it really it leads us to need to think about institutions in a new way, not as established, but as um, sometimes precarious, and therefore to look at questions of resistance as a source of new institutional forms. So in a way, can we learn, I mean, Jonathan's contribution on Dublin was so clear and good on that. I mean, they're a kind of institution, well, they wouldn't be called institutions in the, the normal framework of things, but drawing from Francis's notion of trying to interconnect and break the separations between the established institutions of the economy and the solidarity economy. How can we apply the lessons of, of that sustained resistance that we've seen in Dublin to the question of, um, in a way, defending the echo institutions, but out of those processes of defense, maybe that's where some notion of civic agency can come that can then be a partnership in partnership with local authority with municipalities. Thank you. Can I gather up some more questions? There's a question at the back there, um, James. Um, yes, yeah, so my question is kind of um, inspired by what Peter was talking about, but I think it kind of links to what other people are hinted on about the importance of place. Um, so, if universities are one of these big anchor institutions, we've talked, sort of talked about what the, what the organization of the university can do, but also there's a a really important um, asset of universities, which is the students themselves, um, who are often encouraged to kind of come to a place, consume it for three years, but maybe not really put down roots and invest in that place. Afterwards. So what can universities do to help that? And more importantly, thinking about other types of organisations and institutions, um, there is kind of a consumer attitude towards the place as well, and, you know, gentrification and kind of uh, moving into desirable areas and um, letting other areas kind of decline. So what kind of organisations, institutions can help to um, make it easier for students in university towns, but citizens in ordinary towns to um, invest in the place of their own? A question from yourself in the Great Jumper there. Um, so I guess kind of building on both of those questions and um, uh, mostly directed at Peter, um, I'm curious about the role that more active organizations have played in kind of compelling universities to act like responsible anchor institutions. I'm based in Oxford and we have an absolutely rogue university. So I just <laughs> wonder um, how people have organized and um, how, what sort of channels they've found productive to work through. I mean, new student organizations, we have some staff. We just did community groups, but I was wondering if you had some One more question? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to follow up Hillary's point about anchors and um, uh, agree that on the one hand uh, there is a, a, a significant <coughs> struggle to defend what is good in anchors, but also when we talk about universities, we have to remember that universities have... Uh, a huge weight in any urban space and that that weight can be quite regressive and what I'm thinking about here and I think about this specifically in relation to my own institution and its professions to be engaged with doing public good is that it's a huge gentrification driver and it heats up rental markets right, and property markets so we need to uh, when we're talking about developing anchors have to uh, talk about how uh, about the process of political struggle against them as well as with, with them and how to actually transform them into good civic actors because they're not. As economic actors they can be incredibly regressive and I think we shouldn't leave that out of the conversation. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to pass the mic to my left here and get comments from everyone um, across the panel. Please. Start well, no, start, start with yourself. No. Okay. <laughs> I have to get my thoughts to me. Absolutely agree. My colleague uh, Louise Kempton of Curves has done a lot of research on this. Says you know, if you think about anchor institutions, they can be sticky, solid, dependable, but they can also be regressive, mostly conservative, you know, uh, not open to change, but actually could you know, 
it could be problem. There, there, are, there are problems with the concept of anchor institution. You can get an anchor that actually won't play into this agenda at all. What do you do about that? Which may come into the kind of University of Oxford point about what do you do for your city. So absolutely, I get, I get this point. You, you're entirely right about that. This isn't all super to light. There are some issues around um, the development, of the competitive market for higher education has meant that you know, cities have changed. If you look at all the kind of the cranes in Leeds or Newcastle, most of them are, are university buildings, shiny new buildings, mm -hmm. for a particular purpose. Uh, um, and, and some of it, particularly around accommodation, um, is, is a bit of a challenge for Newcastle. I think there's actually a moratorium on new student accommodation in, in, in Newcastle. Part of which is driven by the fact that um, the local authority wants that land to develop for some other purpose to generate income because it's looking for some sort of, sort of income. And um, they'll not get it through student accommodation because it's treated as residential rather than property, even though. Huge property owners are developing that kind of uh, commercial, uh, that, that student accommodation and deriving lots of profit from it. So there's a, there's a huge, huge problem with the whole kind of financialisation of, of higher education. And I'm sure somebody somewhere is doing a PhD on this, but I would suggest they do. It's, it's just a really fascinating sort of area. I think, um, so the issue about, yeah, Oxford, yeah, <laughs> enormous kind of wealth and, 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 and Ownership, you know, the land between I understand the land between Oxford and Cambridge in, in part is owned by you know the universities and colleges. You you need you need you almost need you need disruptors as well for, for this. And I'm saying disruptors in a sense of those who maybe challenge the institutions themselves, existing institutions, but also smaller emerging institutions as well that actually can challenge the existing anchor institutions. And some of the most progressive um, examples of anchor institution work that I've sort of seen are through some of the kind of smaller post-92 universities. I say small in a sense of turnover, not in terms of students, but very often they've got more students than research, <coughs> research intensive, who absolutely need um, to work with the grain of developing that city and that place because most of their students come from there. Um, you know, Sheffield Hallam is a, University is a perfect example of that. You know, it absolutely needs to understand what it needs to do, not only for the city of Sheffield, but for Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham, and that. It gets the point about um, place matters, um, in, in a sense of you know the attractiveness of place, but also about how it can drive more of the demand side, so that those students have got jobs when they sort of leave. And that's part of the problem which answers the first question of, we've been very good in the north of England and in Yorkshire, as universities, in a sense of producing graduates, but the retention of those graduates has been really difficult in terms of uh, either the jobs have not been there that's made it worth well, well for students to, to, to stay, or they've kind of come in at certain parts of the labour market and you know, there's underemployment. So I think that has to be, this work of anchor institutions has to be set alongside the context of some of the things that Luke was talking about, about the whole issue about local and regional development. For me, it's not separate to it. It's got to be part part of this. Um, you know, about creating quality jobs, mm -hmm. about skills, uh, about the quality of the, the, the infrastructure, the environment. Granted, there's not a magic bullet to this, but you can't just see anchor institution work as separate, in my view. It's got to be seen fundamentally as part of local and regional development activity. Um, and that's, you know, inter we've seen intergenerational divides, and that's really challenging in, in this country, particularly in, in, in England. Um, but if we don't address that, we're seeing the consequences of it, you know, sort of currently. That might mean you do something at a local and regional level, but I also think it means, you know, changing the whole nature of the way in which the national state operates as well. There's a fundamental role to play in this. Um, so, you know, just saying devolve to the north of England, in my view, isn't going to cut it. You know, there has to be a kind of a, a more balanced approach to that. Yeah, it's interesting. You've either got to hope your anchor institutions act as sort of good corporate and inverted commons systems or not, and the work you're doing quite quite clearly is 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 in that is in that direction. But the question happens when it doesn't happen. What do you, what do you do then? Um, as is probably more usually the case, and it's not just a case for you know, the question of the surrounding right universities. It is also about hospitals and other public institutions that are public funded. Now, I'm saying a lot of the word public quite a lot, which kind of hints of a sort of lever and mechanism here by, by which you can induce that better anchor institutional behaviour. 
Um, and you know, changing. Uh, but by the way, austerity. I, I'm also based on Hackney, so I, I, this is how I have it. Sort of steering towards Hackney, but I'm to, <laughs> but what was, I, I was on the board of Hackney Community College for four, fourteen years. I've just stepped down the last year or so. And what's quite clear is public institutions are, are hunkering down. They're backing down the hatches quite clearly. You know, austerity means that it is you pure. You, you shift to an efficiency delivery model. And the engagement becomes more and more fraught and difficult. In that environment, it's very difficult to construct these networks and institutions. The democratic realm is extraordinarily fragmented. And the NHS sits outside of any real democratic control. Universities do to a certain extent. Well, actually, further education does. And also, although less so with some of the devolution that is, that, that is happening to city regions, if you like. So we have to think, one... How do we want anchor institutions to act as institutions, not just as commercial interests? Universities, by the way, are global businesses in many cases, as well as local um, institutions. How can you use the leaders you have, research funds being one, expectations of charitable um, behaviour? Could you use mechanisms? The Social Value Act is there, it's clearly quite toothless, unless people actually want to use it for their own purposes, as I think probably has happened in, in, in Preston and elsewhere. But can you, can you tighten up some of that and start thinking about what the social value requirement is? Public values, I think Neil um, talked about before, but what the social value requirement would look like, not what the possibilities uh, might be. So I think you've got to think through what the mechanisms are, and um, sometimes it might be a case of looking to devolution um, and thinking about how can you devolve powers. In, in, in Manchester, for example, now has control of, of the NHS in, in, in Manchester. That could be quite interesting. Will that lead to a different set <coughs> of community-focused outcomes, different ways of operating, of cooperating with the police, with communities um, and others? Um, so there's an, inspect, there's an interesting live experimentation there, but you've got to lose, use the leads you've got and devolve power um, um, in, in the interim. Um, I was just reflecting on what you were saying about the hospital Hillary, because uh, where I live, uh, a few, quite a few cottage hospitals have been sold off, mm -hmm. and you can see the pressure on the local, the, you know, the <coughs> NHS and the CCGs that they, they are in this terrible situation where they have this immediate need and people who really need that service, um, and then they also have people who see those prime real estate kind of buildings that could be turned into lovely flats, and. They are so kind of hunkered down. You, you kind of, you know, in that situation, you can't, there's no time to reach out and find a different solution. You have to just do that. And so then that ends up with the community being pitted against the very people who are their friends, who are also public servants, who want the best for everybody. And we're being put into that situation, which is hugely problematic. And, and also, yeah, um, you do have to kind of try and fight against it because there isn't the democratic kind of process necessarily to go through. There might be an engagement, some kind of consultation, but there's no real kind of place where you can have a really good conversation mm -hmm. about the difference it might make. And I was just reflecting on what you were saying about universities and how students can get involved and, and citizens. And when I was a kid, my mum went back into education and she was at Bradford University and it was the early 80s and it was really scruffy like people could just go and hang out there and like the bars around were really scruffy they were welcoming you know like people and as I got older and as a teenager I could go into those bars and I spent time with people and around us there were other spaces that were also scruffy that we could just go and hang out in and increasingly those spaces are less and less and less there's no libraries anymore you know it's like the public space where people can just walk in and be and don't have to buy anything they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and so it really is partly down I mean it partly mostly down to how we secure those places and where they feel welcoming to everybody and not just a few people thank you uh, I'll be brief because I don't have much to add but also because I'm hungry um, so um, in terms of relating this to the things that I, I spoke about I suppose that's the most useful contribution I could make and that's I think if you look at a map of England and where public authorities are, it's, it's striking how small the unit of a local authority is, and there is nothing that really between that and central government. And that, for me, there's probably a reason behind that. It's a classic sort of divide and rule tactic, <coughs> really. So if we do want to talk seriously about inclusive local economies, then we, I think we should need to upscale things. We do need to talk about it. It needs to be a progressive, a, a left, a, you know, a progressive answer to the sub-regional 
are suggested being put forward by the right at the moment and that are in place at the moment, so city region mayors and the Northern Powerhouse and Transport for North, these things are evolving at the moment, but there's very little being said about how those things could be turned towards progressive ends, and that's where, for me, the interesting conversation is. I too will be brief because I too want lunch and I also don't want to be standing between you all and lunch. Um, I'll, I'll just say, Hillary, to your point, I mean, I think, and also both supporting and also holding to account institutions, I mean, you, I think we have to play an inside and outside game. There needs to be, um, you know, support uh, uh, and then there also needs to be pressure. Um, I, my background is in community development. I work for a community development corporation. We, we, we work very closely with the city um, to, to act in an in a anchor way, and so we have that important relationship, but we were also very close partners with an organizing project that applied direct political pressure to the city all the time to get them to change the way that they operated and to hold them to account. So, so you have to be able to have both of, of those roles. Um, and then also there has to be a politics around this. You know, institutions are are a leverage point um, that, that we can use to, to better communities, but it, it has to be part of a larger politics of, of change. Um, and so we have to be addressing the systemic roots of, of um, why institutions behave in certain ways and how we can change that more broadly. So, so I'll say that, I mean, easier said than done. And then finally, to the question in the back about what, what can universities do with students in, in the US, there's a lot of, engage scholarship using students to work directly in communities um, and a lot of it is not very good <laughs> it's a lot of sort of um, you know experimentation in communities and popping in and pulling out so I, I think as an anchor institution you can really think more intentionally about how you're uh, really engaging and connecting students in communities I, I'll echo what was said earlier about how um, community colleges um, and and uh, institutions of, of that regard that really their students are also from the community is um, uh, they're, they're really doing interesting um, and, and engaged things and then also students can apply direct pressure to their institutions and, and should um, and that, that's one of uh, the ways to get institutional behavioral change. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can we have a round of applause for our participants? <laughs>